Amen. Amen. Glory. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Father, we acknowledge your presence. We are the assembly of the saints at Philadelphia, the place of an open heaven. Hallelujah. We're asking, Lord, that you move through that open heaven and touch us. Move upon us, quick and stir us. Lift us, lift us. Hallelujah. Lift us, Lord. Lift us. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Lift us. Hallelujah. Lift us, Lord. Open, Lord, the eyes of our understanding. Grant us, Lord, a capacity to hear and to receive that which is of eternal substance. Grant us a hearing ear. And I would ask, Lord, a prophetic tongue that you, Lord, might speak your word to your people in this service, a present word, a word, Lord, that will take us beyond where we are into the place where you would have us. Glory, hallelujah. hallelujah. Glory, thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. hallelujah, thank you, Lord. Glory, quicken us, stir us, Lord. Cause, Lord, impartation. The spirit of impartation. Glory, hallelujah. Lord, the spirit of impartation. Release it, release it, Lord. Hallelujah. Mm. Glory, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Lord. Mm. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Lord, don't take us quite yet. <laughs> Glory. Mm, thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. You're lifting us, Lord. We thank you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Open, open, Lord, the inner depth of our being. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Mm. We've been hearing about <clears throat> an intervention of destiny. Been hearing about a white horse. And the white horse is there to bring us to our appointed place in that destiny. Been hearing about longevity. That is, the Lord's going to give us time to get there. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. From time to time, I've heard a word from the Lord that the Lord is going to give me a center. I've heard it quite a few times. In Albuquerque, Stephen an unusual anointing I, I went through me like fire that the Lord was going to place in my hands a center where people could come and receive what I had to offer, a center. And then I've heard this many times and I've kind of given up because I keep hearing it, but it didn't happen. And then a lady with an unusual prophetic anointing said, this to me. She said, you've been trying to hurry the Lord. You know, I, I do. I, and when I pray, I explain to the Lord that he's from everlasting to everlasting. <laughs> but I, I'm not. And I'm saying, Lord, couldn't you, couldn't you, don't you understand that my time is limited and you need to hurry a little bit. Lord, isn't there any way that you could just hurry a little bit? Just remember, Lord. Well, the lady, this, this lady said, 
this was, an un, this was unusual. She said, the Lord told me to tell you that you're to rest, you're not to be in a hurry. That there is plenty of time for the outworking of all that the Lord intends. That there's plenty of time for the outworking. Now I am past 83 years old. There's plenty of time for the outworking. <laughs> <laughs> Amen? Amen. We're living in a time of intervention, the end time. The anointing is moving from the pulpit into the body. All that Jesus did in a single body, he is about to do again through a corporate body. The works that I do, yes. you'll do also, and greater. Why greater? Because it's the corporate body. Hallelujah. In a service some time ago, the Lord told me to get up and say, the greatest healing visitation that's ever taken place is about to begin. It is not coming from the pulpit, but rather mostly through women and children in the body. It's coming through the body. Individuals, without a calling, without any special gifting or talent, the greatest healing movement this world's ever seen. It's coming through the body. <clears throat> the head is being joined, not to the body. I'm sorry, not to the head, but to the body. It's going to energize the body. Now, I, I said it, and then I thought, I am not going to say it again until I see something that indicates that I'm hearing. So the next service, the Lord again quickened me and I said, I'm not gonna say it <laughs> until I see something. I got absolutely rebuked by the Lord. I mean sternly rebuked and the Lord gave me a passage of scripture. I looked it up and I was rebuked. <laughs> the Lord said I had to say it. So the next service I came and I said, I'm going to say something that I don't want to say. But the Lord told me I have to say it. The greatest visitation that this world has ever seen is about to begin and it's going to come through untalented, ungifted, seemingly uncalled people in the body. It's about to begin. The Lord is getting us ready now. Re Destiny, that point of intervention. Destiny. There's a destined point that the Lord desires. There's a white horse. <laughs> the Lord Jesus himself is going to get us there. He's going to bring us to that place. He's going to lengthen our lives. He's going to give us the time to get there. We're living in an amazing day. No other generation has had the opportunity that we have. In his coming, he very carefully prepared two people for his first coming. Mary, the angel came and said, the Lord has need of your body. And we are to present, we're living in that time, the redemption of our body, the preparation that we can become a visible witness of the glory of God. There's something that's about to be seen through our lives beyond that which is being heard. The Lord has need of your body. Mary's response, that's impossible. <laughs> and I really don't understand. So we all qualify <laughs> for that. But she said something else. Be it unto me according to your purpose. A verse in scripture it's a very unusual verse. It's in Luke chapter 3, verse 2. 
This is perhaps the deepest irony, the most, the deepest irony in all of the word of God. The irony, the, the pain. Annas and Caiaphas being the high priest, the word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias in the wilderness. Annas and Caiaphas, the high priest, a twofold establishing of the religious structure of that day. That which came through Moses' invisible manifest glory had become a dead liturgical form. And the Lord had something to say that had never been said before. And he could not find Annas and Caiaphas being the high priest. He had searched the church of that day and could not find a voice. And he called one. John was not a priest called him apart into the wilderness. That's where we are this time. Called him apart to prepare him to introduce the Lord in his first coming. There was a unique time of preparation. And when Jesus came on the scene, John said something that had never been said before. They were looking for a military leader one who would drive out the Romans, make Israel the head and bring great prosperity to Israel. If John had said, behold the lion, the tribe of Judah, he would have become world famous. He would have been on every talk show of that day. But he didn't. He said something that had never been said before. Behold the, the lamb. It had never been said, never thought of. Cost him his head. Behold the lamb of God. The lamb. He was prepared, uniquely prepared. And just as John singularly was prepared in that day to bring a fresh word that goes beyond all the religious traditions of that day, the Lord uniquely is preparing a people, a corporate John in this day, to bring forth a word with substance and life and the revealed glory of the Lord radiating out through it. He bring forth the Mary, a people committed, sanctified, separated, willing to bear, to become the expression. And my constant prayer, when John was asked who he was, he did not say, I am apostle or prophet John. He said the most profound thing that could be said, he said, I am the voice of another. I'm the voice of one crying. That word crying is an emotion, a word. Not only did John give expression to words, he didn't have a tape recorder in his mouth. But he expressed the very heart of God, the emotions, the feelings, the voice of one what? Crying. He felt, he felt. The fellowship of his sufferings, Paul said, he called, we're called to that. The fellowship of not ours, but the fellowship of what? His. It's very different from anything to do with our sufferings. It's his sufferings. He suffers over Israel, over his people. The fellowship of his sufferings. I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, the voice of another. And that's my prayer. That this body, as Mary yielded her body, that I can come to that state of crucifixion where I no longer live. But the Lord can live his life through my life and give expression 
to that which he intends and desires to speak to his body, his church, in this day, by the grace of God. Hallelujah. Annas and Caiaphas being the high priest, the word of God came to John in the wilderness. The irony of that. The Lord is calling a people today. There is a church within the church, a people within a people, a called out people. Many are called, but few will pay the price in order to be chosen. A people prepared. Genesis 3, I always start with this. Genesis chapter 3. Verse 8. They heard Adam and Eve are hiding. They've transgressed and they're hiding. And they heard the voice of the Lord walking in the garden. Not while they were walking they heard, but they heard the voice walking. The Lord had something to say yesterday. So we have the church at Sardis. Those that have formed a doctrinal position that are very proud of the fact that they have used the King James translation. <laughs> they have a name that they live, but they're dead. That's what the Lord said concerning Sardis. You have a name that you live, but you're dead. Satisfied with the doctrinal position, but denying the present power of God. Denying that the Lord has something to say today beyond what he said yesterday. But he's walking. And in that walking, he did say something yesterday. And I can think back during the Second World War. I was a radar repairman. And the mortality rate, the death rate, radar repairmen, was 98%. And so the position was frozen by the Pentagon. It couldn't transfer out. So from it, I got the idea that I had a one-way ticket. And I began to think about eternity. I did not know there was such a thing as salvation. It had, I didn't have a clue. I didn't know anything, but I knew that probably I was not going to come out of the army alive. And I began to think about it, and I slipped into a small chapel, probably half the size or a third the size of this room. No one was there. I knelt down. I had no intention of saying what I said. It shocked me, in fact. I, I, I didn't know what I was going to do. I knelt down because I was, I was free. I was walking. and. I said, God, if you get me through this war alive, I will go in the ministry when I get out. That absolutely shocked me. It startled me, because I had no intention of saying that. See, there's a destiny. There's a destiny for each of us. Whew, glory. Hallelujah. See, there's a destined point for each of our lives. I did not have a clue. Like Mary of old, the Lord has need of your body. Because here I am, <laughs> up here. When I got out, when I come out of that chapel, the grass was greener, the sky was bluer. I ran to the PX, listened to the news, because I thought maybe Hitler had surrendered. Because <laughs> I knew something happened, but I didn't have a clue. But I thought maybe Hitler had surrendered, literally. And I was disappointed when nothing had happened. It puzzled me. But I can look back. See, way back there, this destined point, there's an empowering in this day, an angel, an angelic, that there's a, there, there, it, see, we, we've struggled. But we're living in the last day. And there's an empowering, an end time empowering that's coming for those that will receive it. The lifting power of his presence no other generation has been privileged to experience. But to whom much is given is much required. 
Therefore, this empowering is coming in a time of tribulation. To many, darkness, but to those who are being empowered, the most brilliant light, yes. the glory of the Lord coming, being restored, activated, the body being energized to become a witness in the earth in this day. That visitation, the empowering of a body. Today, the world is laughing at the church. In that day, they will tremble. Because the word that comes forth will be a word with power, with consequence, with substance. The very life of the Lord, we're being prepared. We yield as Mary, we're being prepared as John. And I'm thinking about this, this center. I don't have a clue, but I don't need to. Lord's time and way, it'll happen. He said, you don't need to be in a hurry. And I'm explaining to the Lord that he better, he needs to hurry. <laughs> I really was. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. He has something to say today. And we're hearing that word. But the word that we're hearing today is preparation for something that he's going to say tomorrow that's beyond what he's saying today. Therefore, there's a spiritual capacity within us that has to be enlarged. Now I'm ready to start. <laughs> this is what I want to say in whatever time I have. The enlarging of the spiritual capacity within us that we can hear, whew, glory, hallelujah. Mm. That we can hear that word tomorrow that goes beyond what he's saying today. Sardis was satisfied with the fact of salvation and the knowledge of a future heaven and wanted to go no further. The church at Laodicea is satisfied with all the gifts and blessings, the conferences with good speakers like Nelville and Stephen, a good conference, totally happy and satisfied, the best spectators you ever saw, but we've got to go beyond that because that is preparation for something beyond, something further. <clears throat> because you say, I am rich and increased in goods, having need of nothing. Because we, we're blessed tremendously. An outstanding conference, we're blessed. But this is preparation for something further. Not something further that's going to come from the pulpit, but it's going to begin to move and happen where? Directly within our lives. The head is about to be joined to the, to the body. The Lord's going to energize the body. And we're, we're about to begin that end time visitation. The Lord is beginning to speak about what he's going to do in that day, how he's going to accomplish it. He's going to show us. Just as he prepared John in the wilderness, he's preparing a people in this day for that greater day of visitation and revelation. Now, Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20. The key to this is the ability to hear. Behold, Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. I stand at the door. This door is the point of transition from the church into the kingdom. The church ends here, and the kingdom begins with chapter 4. I stand at the door and knock. In Revelation, they heard the voice of the Lord what? What, what? what was he doing? He was walking. He's walked 
for six days. We're at the end of that time. And now he's still walking, but he's doing something more. He's what? He's knocking. Why? The urgency of the hour to attract our attention because we're living in a time when we've never been busier than we are this present time. So busy. We need to listen. The Lord has something further. Beyond what he did yesterday and accomplished, beyond what he's saying today, he's preparing a people for what he's going to say tomorrow. He's got something further. It has to do with the head becoming the head, directly the head of the body. The voice, John said, I'm the voice of one, of another. And we're going to become that corporate voice. And in the book of Revelation, the voice of Jesus is always spoken of as being the sound of many waters. That's the corporate body. If you're going to understand Revelation, you have to know that this is not, Revelation is not talking about five foot, eight, six, two, I don't know how tall Jesus was, but it's talking about the corporate Jesus. The corporate Jesus, we, the expression of his life, bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. He prayed that we might be one with him, even as he is one with his father. That we might give expression to his life, his corporate body. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone, what? Hears my voice. Now we have a part in this, not only hearing, not only are we to hear, but we have a direct part in it. If anyone hears and what? That's our part. To develop an ability to hear. And then to be willing to enter into whatever he has, wherever it leads, whatever it cost, an ability. If anyone hears and opens the door, I will come in. This is the end time visitation of the Lord, coming into our lives to be glorified through a people that are willing to become a part of this corporate John, the Baptist in this hour and day. If anyone hears and opens the door. After this I looked, why? He heard the knock. It says the door was open. The word was is fortunately in italics. When a word is in italics, it means that the translator thought that the writer didn't quite understand. And they added a word to make it mean what they thought it should mean. And the best thing to do is to cross them out. It's not a door was opened. But when he looked, a door opened. Very different. The translation ruins it, wrecks it. He didn't look and the door was open. No. When he looked, a door opened. And I heard, as it were, a voice as a trumpet, which said, come up. We have been moving horizontally. We're about to begin to move vertically. We've gone as far as we can go. We're at the end of the church age. There's nothing any further. That's why Jesus is knocking on the door, it's shut. Because there's nothing any further. There's only one way to go, up. We're at the end. Come up and I will show you things which must be hereafter. I begin to pray this. The book, The Mysteries of the Kingdom, is the outcome of, this, of my praying this verse, come up and I will show you things which must be hereafter. The book came out of that prayer. And immediately, we're not quite there, but we're making some progress. Immediately I was in the spirit. 
Previously, there had been a pulpit. But now we're moving from the pulpit to what? To the throne. I wrote something down the other day that the Lord gave me. The goal of the church is heaven. The goal of the kingdom is the throne. The desire of the church is Jesus within. The desire of the kingdom is Jesus upon. He's becoming the head of the body. The church ministers through grace, but the kingdom operates through government. The message of the church is to whomsoever, but the message of the kingdom is to he who overcomes. The testimony of the church is, I have Jesus. The testimony of the kingdom is, Jesus has me. Hallelujah. 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 <laughs> Glory. Amen. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lord. And me, I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne. See, we're coming under. That's... that's this angel of destiny. That applies to each of us. We're being called, we're, we're gonna be empowered. There, there, there's an aid, a lifting. We're to be lifted. I felt it, I thought I was, I felt like I was going up. Come up. And when we begin to touch the kingdom, we begin to, we're, 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 we're lifted. There's an empowering, a lifting. In the, if, you, if you were to read the message to the seven churches in Revelation, the promise to each church varies, but there's two things that are in common that the Lord said in common to all seven churches. The first one is this, I know your works. Because our tendency is to relate our relationship to the Lord through what we're doing. And the devil loves to tell us that, you're, that we're not doing anything. Acts 1.8 says, you shall be, no, don't turn to it, but Acts 1.8 says, you shall what? Be, it does not say do witnessing, it says be, you shall be a witness. The Greek word for witness is martyr. You can look it up, it's martyr. That is, I'm to die, I live yet not I, I'm to die, why? So Jesus can be seen through my life that I can become the expression of his life. And my constant prayer for the meeting that I have, the monthly meeting in DC is this, is that I can be a conduit to release the presence of God into the body. That I can become as a conduit to release, whew, glory, the presence of God into the body. You shall be a martyr, not a dead one, but what? A living martyr. A lively stone. The glory radiating out through our lives. Shall be witnesses, not of me or for me. And I struggled with this for a long time. You shall be witnesses unto me. As I witness to the Lord, I become one with him. And then his life flows into my life and out through and touches your life. Not a witness of, but a witness to, shall be. The other thing he said was this. He said, I know your works, because that's our tendency. He said, I'm not interested in what you did. I'm interested in what you have become. And what you did was a part of what you're becoming. It's the enabling power. We are his workmanship created unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should. That's conditional. I owned a very successful business. And I was sitting in church on Sunday thinking about how to earn more money on Monday. And I was speaking at a conference, this was 1970. I was speaking at a conference in, and 
this businessman came. He owned the largest Lincoln Mercury agency in the entire East Coast. And he said, if only I could be like you, if I could just, this business, if I could just be like you, you know, I'm standing in the pulpit. And I said, no, you have it wrong. He said, you're all, no, that's not it at all. I'm not here because I'm spiritual. I'm here because I'm so needy. There's no other way the Lord could have ever got me through. I was, I was where, you, where you are. I was sitting in church on Sunday trying to figure out how to earn more money on Monday. I wasn't making it. The Lord had to put me up here or I never would have made it. But you have a business and you're successful. You're being successful. You put the Lord first. And the Lord can trust you owning a business. He couldn't trust me. You're, you're miles ahead of me. Well, that stirred him. He went back, got his couple hundred employees together, and made a public commitment of his business <laughs> to the Lord. And later, I stopped by to see him. And he said two of the, uh, of the top executives from the Ford Motor Company just left. And they said, we came because our records show that you are ordering the, consistently ordering the cars that are selling, the colors and the models that are selling. And we want to know, how are you doing that? Well, they did not want to hear what he said. <laughs> Amen. I know your works. And the other thing is, let him who hath an ear, all seven churches in common, let him that hath an ear hear the importance of our hearing. Now, Matthew chapter 13. Matthew. Matthew chapter 13. This is one of the most interesting chapters in all the word of God. Verse 9. Who hath ears to hear? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone what? hears the Lord has something to say today beyond what he said yesterday and that word is preparation for what he's going to say tomorrow the disciples came and said to him why are you speaking to them in parables and he said because it is given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it's not given. I said, oh, there's two types of people in every meeting. Now that's, I, not this meeting, other meetings. <laughs> there's two types of people. Got a, I got a profound revelation. It's given to you to know the mysteries, but to them it's not given. In every meeting there's two types of people. Yous and thems. <laughs> Profound revelation. So, except you become as little children, you can't enter the kingdom. So I begin to pray a very profound prayer. And actually, the Lord understood it. Lord, I want to be a you and not a them. A profound prayer. I want to be a you and not a them. It's given to you to know what? The mysteries of the kingdom. See, we're being prepared today to hear something tomorrow that's beyond what we're hearing. There has to be a willingness, a new wineskin, a willingness to go beyond our present understanding, which will be consistent with Scripture, but beyond our present understanding of Scripture. Hallelujah. Let him who hath an ear. Now, the motive of our heart will determine the rate of our spiritual growth, our willingness to listen, to receive, to allow the Lord to actively begin to work within our lives, to become a part of this corporate witness that he's forming in the earth in this day. Many are called, but few will pay the price in order to be chosen. In John chapter 6, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John chapter 6.
A great multitude, verse 2, a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles. These came out of curiosity. They were observers. The Lord fed them the best meal they ever had. There was a little lad. He had five loaves and two fishes. And after they were fed, there was 12 basketfuls left over. And later the Lord said to the disciples, he asked them, he said, remember those numbers, five, two, and 12. There's an end time principle of supply and provision involved in this. The disciples received something, but the multitude ate the best meal they ever had. There was 12 basketfuls left over. That means they ate to the full and they were burping on a miracle. <laughs> they ate to the full. The meal was so good, but no matter how good a meal is, after a certain length of time, you're going to become hungry again. So they came back. They said, Lord, this is tremendous. It didn't cost us anything. The Lord took it, broke it, gave it to the disciples, and it was, it was brought to them. They were, they were hand-fed. Didn't cost them a thing. They said, this is tremendous. Lord, do it again. Do it again. And the Lord said, I have something better for you. He said, I have something better. Except you eat. Your father, all right, I'm going to back up. Ex your fathers ate manna in the wilderness, and they are dead. But if you will eat my flesh and drink my blood, you will live forever. They scorned, they ridiculed, and they left. So many left that the Lord said to the 12, will you also go? That had to hurt. And later, if you read chapter 11 in 1 Corinthians about communion, when Jesus said, do this in remembrance, we always think about a sentimental thing about Jesus. That's not what he's talking about. When, when the multitude, he offered them his very life, and they ridiculed him and they left. That had to hurt. So many left that he said to the 12, will you also? But he couldn't explain it because it wasn't time. But in the fullness of time, in the evening before he gave his life on the cross, he said, he took bread and said, this is, he did not say it's a symbol or an emblem. He didn't say that. The church does. And that ruins it. That makes it a liturgical form and very religious with no life in it. He took bread and he said, this is my body. He took the cup and he said, this is. Lord, I look and I see bread, but you said it's your body. Lord, I choose to believe. Not what I see, I choose to believe what you said. This is my body. Do this in remembrance. What? Do, the Lord is saying this, do this in remembrance of what I said in John chapter 6, but could not explain at that time. When he said, do this in remembrance, you go back and you read John chapter 6. Except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life. But if you'll eat my flesh and drink my blood, you'll live forever. The Lord, we're, this is an end time truth. We're being delivered from the liturgy of religious form concerning communion. It's an end time truth. Jesus is the tree of life. He's a root out of a dry ground. That is in mystical form we see and understand. He is the tree of life and we receive longevity as we partake of his very life. The multitude did, had no capacity to understand. They, were, they, they would have gladly received more loaves and fishes. Gladly. But when he offered them something beyond that, they rejected it. They rejected it. Scorned, they ridiculed, they left. There was no capacity. And I feel the heart of what the Lord's given me is developing a capacity to hear beyond our present experience, to go beyond that, that capacity to hear, to, 
to be able to, for the word, that which we hear, all these tremendous things, it's nice to hear them, but they've got to become personalized within our lives. And we also begin to move and function in that. The multitude left. He said to them, you seek me not because you saw the miracles, because you did eat of the loaves and fishes. It's the gospel of prosperity. Satisfied with what the Lord can provide and not willing to go any further. You have a name that you live, but you're dead. You've not become that which will bring the greater glory to the Lord. Luke chapter 5. There's a preparation. Otherwise, we're not going to receive, we're not going to be available to the Lord in that day. This angel of destiny will not be able to accomplish his purpose through our lives unless there's that deeper work of preparation and a willingness to hear something beyond our present limitations and understandings. Luke chapter 5. It came to pass. I like that. No matter what problem you're having, it'll pass. <laughs> it came and it's going to pass. <laughs> came to pass. That is the people, see in, in John chapter 6, the peop, why did the people come? What was their reason? They came to what? To see miracles. They came to see miracles. He fed them to the full. But they had no capacity for the deeper thing that he was about to say and do. There was no capacity. Luke chapter 5. As the people pressed, see, they came to see. Let him that hath an ear, what? Hear. Hear. Now, it, as the people pressed upon him to what? to hear the word of God. He stood by the lake of Gennesaret. There were two ships. There's always two ships, always. His way and our way. There's always two ships. There's one going the right way and there's one going the wrong way. <laughs> I think we're familiar with that. There's always two ships. Jonah had that problem. There was two ships. <laughs> One was going the right way, one was going the wrong way. We better get in the right one. Yeah. Hallelujah. There were two ships, the fishermen were gone out of them. Now we're all fishermen. We fish for acceptance, for love, to be appreciated, for the things that we desire. See, we fish. We have desires. But these fishermen were washing their nets. The net is the thing that we use to get what we want. In other words, they were cleansing their methods, the methodology that they used to get what they wanted. The church needs to do this. Desperately needs to do this. They're washing their nets. The methods that we use to get what we want. And he entered into one of the ships and prayed that he would thrust out a little from the land. The land, I've got my two feet on the ground. I can go this way or that way. I'm in control. But he pushed out a little. So my feet, uh, now I'm in the realm of the spirit. He pushed out from the land, but I still am pretty much in control because I still touch bottom. So he has something beyond that, but there's a preparation first that has to take place. So he sat down and what? He taught them. He sat down and taught them. 
He pushed out a little. That means the atmosphere, it was shallow. But there was a teaching, a preparation for the deeper, for something further. You just can't get into the deeper. Somebody said once about a service that, that I had, they said, that's shallow. They said, that's shallow. I'm waiting for the deeper thing. And I, I asked the Lord about that. And I got an answer. Jesus pushed out what? A little. That means it was what? It was shallow. But he sat down and what? He taught them. The teaching was not to entertain them, but to prepare them. Because later he said what? Launch out into the deep and let your net down. And this is what the Lord said. Unless you have met the Lord in the shallow place, you will never be prepared for the deeper. See, don't despise the days of, of beginnings. Become critical. But allow these things to do their work within us. A preparation. Accept you meet the Lord in the shallow place, you will never receive the word. He pushed out a little, he sat down, and he taught them. And then he said, launch out into the deep and let your nets down. He's getting us ready for that day, for that catch that's going to come this day of visitation. But we're in that, this time of preparation, of being made ready for that day. The Lord's getting us ready. Now, Revelation, a profound verse. Revelation chapter 19 and verse 7. If you have your Bible, I'd really like you to look at this. And the American Standard translation has it right. And if you have a Schofield Bible, if you look at the footnotes, Schofield added a footnote to this verse. And this is what the footnote says. It says, it says, um, this verse does not mean what it says. <laughs> That's right. We're saved by grace through faith, not of works. He said, this verse, Schofield does, you can look, get, get a Schofield Bible. It says, this verse does not mean what it says. Be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. She's what? Now, I want you to say, I'm not, I usually don't do this. But I'm going to do it. She's what? herself ready Whew, glory see I, I feel that in the marrow of my bones there's a place of preparation we're in that time of preparation for the greater day we're almost there she's made what self ready to her was granted and this is American standard and this is accurate translation to her was granted that she should array herself in fine linen, for fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. That she should array herself. See, we're in this time of what? Preparation. We're being made ready. There's two verses in Revelation couple passages, contrast. I, the contrast, one time I, in January, I was in Fairbanks, Alaska, and it was 20 or 30 below zero and snowing and freezing cold. I mean, it was cold. It was so cold that you couldn't get warm no matter what you did. And I came back, was home one day, and went to Bermuda. <laughs> I'm sorry, not Bermuda, Barbados. Went to Barbados, which is even better. And I said to the man I went with, should I bring a sweater? And he said, no, you won't need it. And I couldn't quite conceive of it. But the contrast 
from, to go from Fairbanks, Alaska to Barbados, the contrast. Well, that's the contrast between John chapter 6, the multitude came to see miracles, and Luke chapter 5, a multitude pressed to what? They pressed, they came to see, but they pressed to what? To hear. The contrast is profound. And this is another one that's equally profound. I'm going to show it to you because normally you wouldn't see it. It's in uh, Revelation chapter 5. We're going to go back and forth a little bit. In chapter 5 of Revelation, verse 9, they sang a new song saying, You are worthy to take the book, to open the seals thereof, for you were slain and hath, have redeemed us to God by thy blood, every kindred tongue, people, and nation. And hath what? Made us. See, his wife hath made herself ready. That, that, uh, that cooperative relationship that we enter into with the Lord where we cooperate with him, this destiny of this angel of the destiny, the preparation of an end time people is intensifying. Intensifying. We're going to be lifted from the earthly. Hath made kings and priests, and we shall reign. Now, the bride is clothed in what? Fine what? Linen. Now, chapter 7, verse 9. Chapter 7, verse 9. If you look at f chapter 5, verse 9. Redeemed us from every, uh, by thy blood, every kindred, tongue, people, and nation. 5, 9, now 7, 9. A great multitude which no, no man could number of all nations, kindred, people, and tongues stood before the throne, before the Lamb, clothed in what? White robes. They had palms. Palm is the type of salvation. They cried with a loud voice saying what? Salvation. salvation. Now, verse 14. He said, Who are these, sir, thou knowest? These are they which have come out of great tree, have washed their robes, what? White robes, in the, washed in the blood of the Lamb, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God in what? Serve. Serve. But in chapter 5, they have linen garments. Chapter 7, it's white robes, our garments washed, satisfied with the fact of salvation. They cried with a loud voice saying, what? Salvation. In chapter 5, they said, you have made us what? What are they? They're kings and priests. And we shall what? Reign. In chapter 7, verse 15, they are before the throne of God. Chapter 5, if you look in the context, they're in the midst of the throne. Here they are before the throne. And they what? They what? They serve day and night forever. In life, we grow vertically. In eternity, we expand horizontally. These will serve for all eternity. They'll never come to chapter 5. Thou hast made us under God kings and priests, and we shall what? Reign. Reign. These are serving for all eternity. The most I'm not waiting for, e for eternal life. I have it. But this is the greatest part of all eternity because my life presently is determining what I'm going to be for all eternity. And the Lord said, well done. Didn't say much done. He said what? I'm thankful. Well done. See, I know your works. He's not interested in that. He's interested in what we become. He said, well done. Good. That means godly. That means I've been made conformable to his image. Faithful. Why? And I'm thinking back in 1944 in that little chapel. 
I didn't know there was such a thing as salvation. But something happened. Why? Because the way back there, the Lord saw me standing here this morning. And I've often said this, I, you have no idea what's in between there and here. And I feel sorry for the Lord, what I put him through to get me from there to here. I really feel sorry for him. I hope he didn't have that, ma that many problems with you. <laughs> Hath made us kings and priests. As a king, I relate to the earthly. As a priest, I relate to the heavenly. My life totally, I present my body, the totality of my life to become the expression of his life. Second Thessalonians, almost finished. Second Thessalonians chapter one. He's getting us ready for something. And, he's deep, and there has to be a capacity within us and services such as where the, the, the manifestation of the Lord's presence. It's tremendously important because we're being changed from not sermon to sermon, conference to conference. We're being changed from what? Glory, glory to glory. That is by the presence, by the presence. When we come into that presence, our capacity is being enlarged. So then there's a preparation because this tells us the next thing in the schedule. This is the next thing. This is about to happen. When he shall come to be glorified, where? Where? In the saints. Who's that? Us. He's come to be glorified where? In, within our lives. Therefore, there has to be a capacity. And when he came into the temple of his day, he dealt with money changers. He drove them out. Because he was looking forward to the time when his glory would come in and could not. We are the temple. There's a preparation that has to take place. He's coming to be glorified where? in the saints. Now here's the scary part. I mentioned it's given to you to know but to them. In that day I would like to be in chapter 5 of Revelation and not chapter 7. In that day I would like to be in chapter 5 of Luke and not chapter 6 of John. Satisfied, looking for a good meal, up to be blessed and satisfied with it. He's coming to be glorified in the saints and admired by all them that believe. The first part of this verse, Luke chapter 5, Revelation chapter 5. The second part, admired by all them that believe, John chapter 6, the multitude that came to see miracles. Chapter 7 of Revelation, our robes washed in the blood of the Lamb, and standing before the throne. Remember the one that got into the wedding without the right garment? Yeah. They had the garment of salvation, but not the bridal garment. The Lord said, bind him, because he couldn't function there. Cast him into outer darkness. Outer darkness is in heaven. It's in heaven. He said, friend, now, we have in chapter 5 and 7, it said, a multitude that no man could number stood before the throne. Here's the throne, a multitude that no man could number. So that line could be 1,000 miles long, 500 miles long, whatever it is. And the light's coming from the S-U-N. So if I'm 20 feet out, or I'm 20 miles out, seemingly I have the same amount of light and I could be very deceived. 
because seemingly I have the same amount of light. But in that day, the sun's going to be darkened, the S-U-N, and the light's going to come from where? The throne. So if the light comes from the throne, the further out I go, what happens? It gets darker and darker until I come to outer. I'm way, way out there. That's scary. The Lord is preparing a people in this day. He has sent a white horse. He's going to get us there. He sent the angel of destiny. This is our destiny. Whew, hallelujah. Glory. Amen. He's going to get us there. And we need to begin to allow the Lord to do that deeper work of preparation to get us ready. That in that day we will be in Revelation chapter 5 and not Revelation chapter 7. We will be in Luke chapter 5 and not in Luke chapter 7. I'm sorry, John chapter 6. Satisfied with loaves and fishes, being blessed with prosperity, blessings, provisions, whatever they may be. They're for a purpose. And the purpose transcends and goes beyond that. And I thank the Lord for all that he's given and done. I thank the Lord for that. But he's walking. He said something yesterday, and that got me to where I am today. But he's still walking. Whew. Glory. And he's got something to say tomorrow that will take me beyond where I am today. And if I'm going to be a part of that, there has to be a capacity that's built within, developed. I have to have a capacity or else I'm going to come short in that day. Well done, godly and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of your Lord. Because you have been faithful over a few things, I will make you ruler over much. Thou hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall what? Reign on the, on the earth. Satan, in effect, said that he could rule better than God. And the Lord and, his, and all creation heard it, and one-third the angels believed it. Became the powers, the principalities, and the powers of darkness. The Lord could have zapped Satan, but that question would have remained. And for six days, the Lord has allowed Satan to rule, and all creation has seen how he rules. Hatred, violence, war, death, disease, sickness, hatred, wrath, violence, on and on and on. They have never seen how God rules, because he only rules in the hearts, within the hearts of those who give him permission. But there's a coming day in which he is going to rule. And the wisdom of God is this. That rule will come through the very ones that Satan deceived. That's God's wisdom. The very ones that Satan deceived will be used to bring him down. For the Lord said to Satan, you bruise their heel, and we've limped from that day to this spiritually. But that's about to change. But you will bruise his head, that's fatal. The Lord's getting a people ready for that day. And by the grace of God, we are that people. Father, we ask now, hallelujah, Lord, that we be quickened, enabled, empowered. Somehow help us to hear. The angel is here, the white horse. You're ready to move. Develop within us a capacity to become a part of that which you're about to do. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. and amen.